My name is Susan Hawthorne. I'd like to welcome you all to this wonderful double launch this evening. Um, we, we respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their custodianship of the lands and waterways. The countries on which Spinifex offices are situated are Jiru, Banarong and Wurundjeri, Wadawurrung, Gundungara and Noongar. We also acknowledge the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom and the freedom of lesbians, often at the cost of their lives. So I'd like to introduce you uh, to our two wonderful authors this evening. And really, I'm just so thrilled to have you both here and, and talking to us. Um, I'm really excited. So, um, First of all, I'm going to introduce Lucy Mushika. She is a novelist, uh, an essayist and a speaker. Um, born in Zimbabwe, she grew up in a traditional village before going to France at the end of apartheid. Uh, after a short stay in the US, she went back to France and taught English in primary schools, at university and to uh, multi, in, multinational executives. Uh, with a University of Sydney MA in creative writing, Lucy writes full-time and she lives between France and Australia and she's published in English, Italian, French and other languages and this book won a prize in, uh, in France. It was also translated into French. So Lucy, welcome to you. It's, it's really fantastic to have you here. And Robin, Robin is a Melbourne-based author and playwright and her love for the theatre led to uh, her study in drama. Uh, she completed her teaching degree and was employed at, as a member of the Bouverie Street Theatre in Education team, very famous Melbourne institution, uh, and taught uh, drama at Strathmore Secondary College for more than two decades. And that gave her the chance to write lots of plays um, for, for the students. And uh, among the others that she wrote, they were performed at the Carlton Courthouse under the umbrella of La Mama. Um, she's also had a, a, another novel previously published, The Girl in the Bath. And actually, Lucy, you have another book too, don't you? Um, it's got the word virgin in the title, but you can tell us when you say more about yourself. And um, Robin's book was published in 2014. So um, just to hand over to both of them, I'm just going to start um, with a couple of questions. So we've had a really good week this week. We had an in real life launch of Robin's book on Tuesday, which went fabulously well. And if you read the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age this weekend, you will discover a review of Lucy's book. So that's always exciting. Um, so, Lucy, if you could please introduce the story of Chinongwa, say something about your publishing history, but also um, uh, about, you know, about, about the origins of the work. Thank you, everybody. Um, Chinongwa uh, is actually an accident uh, because I grew up in uh, Zimbabwe, which was then Rhodesia during apartheid. And the books that we read were written by Europeans. So Jane Austen, Jane Austen the Dickens and all those. And for me, books were written by dead people from England and we read them. So there was no way I could write a book. But growing up uh, in a very uh, traditional village, in apartheid, men were not allowed to have their wives with them at work. So a lot of the men from 18 or from 15 to, I don't know, 50, they were working. So the people who kind of read in the village, the real authorities were these grandmothers and us kids, we divided them into the good and the bad. 
The good ones poured jam into your mouth and you love them forever. The bad ones smacked you because you were playing in mud and they tell you on your mother and you don't like them. And then there was this one that I named Chinongwa. She was a bad woman. We didn't like her. As kids, we were horrible with her, kicking her hands, chickens and things like that. One day, I overheard two grandmothers talking about Chinongwa. And because I was there, I joined into the conversation. And one of them turned around and said, if you repeat what you heard, I'll wash your mouth with salt. Suddenly, this grandmother fascinated me. What was it that I wasn't supposed to repeat? And I followed her. I knew that I had to listen in, not asking questions. And then years later, I'm in France. My kids, I've just come back from the States. My kids speak English, so I send them to Pantenal School. And I have time on my hands for the first time in my life. So I decide to write this story just to understand what had happened. And also when I went back, back home, I realized that I was a mother now and I was not going to be chased away. So I asked the questions, what happened? And little by little, the story comes out and you realize this bad woman maybe is not the bad one here. So, and when I finished, I actually finished writing the book when I was in living in Melbourne in Australia. And friends were like, can I read, can I read? So the manuscript was passed from friend to friend, uh, just, you know, pages that were put together. And the friends started calling it a book or a manuscript, said, Why I, when are you going to get it published? And I was like, what do you mean? I, I can't write books. And the only books that I really had un discovered that you could write a book about Africa and things happening in Africa and spring is in October was Doris Lessing. Mm -hmm. So a friend helped me and a South African publisher agreed to, to publish it. And there is the story of Chinongwa. Well, thank you very much. Um, Robin, can you say something about the story of Matilda and also your publishing history? And, and how does writing for the theatre play into your craft as a novelist? Oh, that's an extremely good question. I think with um, I'll start with writing for the theatre, if that's okay. Um, it's an amazing thing to write for the theatre because once you um, have a play, you can get the actors up on their feet and work with them in a collaborative way and work out things that aren't that may not be working in the story or things that aren't true to the character. And so um, even when the play has been written, it's a work in progress if you're working with the actors once they're on their feet and off the page. Um, it's very different uh, writing a novel because it's just you and your computer, your ideas and your characters for such a long time. It, it takes a long time, whereas a play seems to be able to, it's, uh, quicker to write I think and then once you've written you've got you know the input from other people um, but a novel is there a long time before it goes to um, an editor or a publisher and you just live with it and the thoughts in your head for a long time uh, yes but um, I did it I this story that of about my grandmother Matilda the Russ Redland is about my grandmother and her life um, it started way back when I was a little girl. Um, she used to live with us on and off when I was a little girl. And I would, and I was, I'm talking, I was four or five at the time. I can remember I would sit on her knee in front of the open fireplace in winter and um, on her knee under the apple and orange trees in our backyard in the summer. And she would tell me these stories about her life and growing up and, and the, the the images were so strong that they've stayed with me for a long, long time throughout the years until I finally had the time to write it. I mean, being a being a teacher, being um, involved in theatre, having children, uh, it was a long time until I actually got to the stage where I could you know, sit down and write a novel. Um, and I wonder how many women there are like that who 
go through their life doing a million things with with kids and careers or jobs that earn the money and don't find the time to really write if they want to write until they're older. Um, I probably didn't start writing until I was in my 40s and it's taken me until I'm in my 60s to write about my grandmother. But those those stories have stayed with me all my life. So there was there were strong images and and yeah, it wasn't just her, it was her whole family. She's the oldest of nine siblings. And as such, she was the one who had to stay at home and help her mother raise the other children and so couldn't continue on at school as she wanted to. Um, and she was expected to do that until she um, met and got married herself and started her own family. So her life was sort of mapped out for her. Um, but she had a bit more, um, she wanted more. And so this is about my grandmother who wanted more and I wanted more for her. She told me these stories and I got older and, and grew up and, and realised the injustices that she would, you know, that um, she had to suffer and not being able to do things. And a lot of women of that era um, couldn't do the things they wanted to. They were locked into what the patriarchal society wanted. So, um, yes, so I finally got to write this novel and I am so glad that it's ended up with Spin Effects Press because it's just been a wonderful journey. Um, so thank you to Spin Effects Press for that. So yes, um, uh, I uh, when Susan told me that we would be doing a double launch, I didn't know quite what to expect. And I have read your book two times. First, I, I just read because I it was something completely new. And what is I found quite striking is that uh, though we are both talking about these grandmothers, though Chinong was not my real grandmother, but she, she could have been. She was a grandmother in the village. And your grandmother was uh, born 18, 19, uh, 1888, 1888, yes. Would have yeah. been there. And Chinong was born in 1909. So she was younger. At the same time, I relate a lot to your grandmother in the sense that I grew up in a village. I was lucky in the sense that my mother had worked before she got married. So I think she understood uh, the independence of a woman who worked and she lived, but she lived in a village because there was no way she was married and would go continue to work. So when she got married, she stopped working and she, I grew up in a village. And a lot of the girls who were in my class or I went to school to with, they finished grade five. So after five years, it was like, now you can read and write so that you'll be able to read the letters from your husband. Now you go and help your mother exactly like that. And I remember one of the biggest fears in my life was to be stopped from going on uh, with education. And there are many times when uh, Matilda is reading and that was a escape. And for me, one, we were not allowed to play with boys. You were supposed to be helping them when we had to sit like this, walk, walk like this, so that would be marriageable. And uh, I was reading and realizing there's another life there and all the books that you mentioned. And I just went back to my life and I remember reading Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Berry Finn, and saying, thank God they don't know I'm playing with boys. Because for me, those were my friends that I spent uh, life with. And I love the first sentence, if I may read it, yes. of your book. Matilda huddles against the rough wall of the slab hut digs her small bare toes into the unforgiving dirt floor and stares at the tightly wrapped bundle on the kitchen table, willing it to wiggle and cry. It sets the tone and the rhythm. And there is a lot of sadness, there is death, 
there are some joys, but you never, you, you just write it as it is. This is what happened. And this is how she, and how women are today would say groomed to think in a certain way, because even though inside she is rebellious, outside she does what she's told and she knows and she she, she can't really go against a, 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 a father but i like how the reader is inside the room close to mama there's no escape and and it's also the you use the present tense that makes it so immediate and i was just wondering why did you choose the present tense did you start it in the present did you change no, I didn't start it in the present tense at all. Um, somewhere along the line, I decided to change the whole thing um, to present tense. I think I'd been to a writing workshop um, where uh, they were talking about the strengths of the present tense and how um, how it was a, a good way to write. And so I, I, I came home and looked at what I'd done and, and changed it. Um, but I think it works in the present tense. It um, works perfectly because the reader has no escape because what she is seeing, you're seeing when she's close to mama is watching mama with tears uh, threatening or mama is having a depression. You are there in the kitchen with her. You are cooking whatever she is cooking. You've got all these little babies around her and the responsibility that she feels like it's a duty as the eldest to look after all this kids that keep coming out of mama like a little factory <laughs> yes like, and yeah. then the sense of humor on page 12 when the doctor comes and uh, allowing I quote allowing the doctor to stride into the kitchen and fill it with his self-important bulk I just laughed <laughs> oh, thank you Lucy well I I find um your writing absolutely incredible. You are totally that your, the sto your story is heartbreaking um, of of this beautiful nine year old little girl, you know who. But you, the way you write, you you, I feel as though um, I'm there too. That I'm I'm I can see the landscape. I can see the food. Um, perhaps taste the food. Um, it gets so immersed into the surroundings and what the life was like there. And, and the fact that you've written the first first part of the book, book one in the um, third tense. Yes, I'm right, aren't I? And the, the next part of the book um, um, in first person, uh, I think that is astounding. The first person that you write in for the second part of the book. So you get right into Shinawa's um, mind and her, the other, um, excuse me, my and mind's I gone agree. blank, uh, both women's minds so that you can actually feel and see what they're experiencing and, like, the way they think is incredible. Yes, so... Yes, I I, um, I think I, I wrote this uh, book too because uh, for those who don't know the book, it's book one where it's a third person omniscient and because she's small, because she doesn't quite understand what's happening, because she mixes up the tales uh, uh, from that are told in the evenings and reality because there are snakes who speak and they give eggs to humans. And then there is where they used to live, where there was milk and honey flowing. And for her, she can't really tell if it's reality or not. Mm -hmm. But when I had to write about when she's been given away, I think I first wrote it in the third person. I wrote it in the past tense. I wrote it in the present tense. I wrote it in continuous, but always in third person. But it was difficult for me to get inside her. And then I don't know, one day there's a light bulb that comes out into there and I write it from her. And then there was this liberation and I could see her, I could hear her. And the scene when the, the women sing each other, 
I, I couldn't write that in the third person because there's no way you can feel the gut wrenching that she, she's going through. So after I started again and then went with the, the first wife and then her and the, and then the husband, of course they are unreliable narrators, but I think that's what it is all about. Because I remember somebody who read the story and said, but what, what is the truth? Because I'm frustrated, what is the truth? And I'm saying, well, we are all looking for the truth. Everybody has got their own truth. And Chinongo's truth was she didn't ask for it. And the first wife's truth is, I saved you. And she was right, she had saved them. And she had looked after her as if it was a chi her child. But she did, She did. there was no way she could look at it from Chinongo's point of view, who, who was like, I didn't want that. So the two women, some people say, I like my guru better, or Chinongo should have been more grateful. They were both right. It's just they found themselves in a situation. And when I first started writing the book, I had been told that the husband all constantly told Chinonga, I never chose you. I never wanted you. And I thought that was a horrible thing to do. And then when you look at it closely, you discover that he was in a way also a victim of uh, tradition. And yes, I, I found it wonderful that you actually included a chapter from his point of view as well. I, mm. I thought, um, yes, because he does come across as the victim. So in some ways, uh, the society has victimised the men as well as the women. Am I yeah. Thinking? yeah. And that's why I think it's very important that we talk or we think about what we are doing instead of just living as if we are, I don't know, robots. Because when you, you stop to think, why was she given away? Was there was that a solution? No. And yet today, girls are still uh, being given away. And I would like to thank, uh, because I just, just a little quick history of the book of Chinongwa. First, it was published by a South African uh, publisher and because I was surprised that they were going to publish it and it was going to be a book which was not at all what I had intended so it was something that was very strange because I was in France I was now teaching I'd read written this book while I was waiting for my children to be a little bit older because I wanted them to speak English so I wanted to look after them so after I went back from Melbourne, my son was 12. So I said, okay, now I can go to work. The book is finished. It was just to help me survive. So when the publisher published it, I just signed the contract. And well, it was not a very good contract and I was tied to him and he never paid me and there are many things. But then it was translated into French and I, I had this book that was sort of in South Africa uh, in English, and now there were no more copies. And I, I remember the day I watched on the news in France, a journalist speaking to an Afghanistan woman uh, just after the Americans left. And this woman was telling her she was going, she had given away a 10 year old and the man was going to collect her. And the journalist turns to the little girl and said, uh, so what do you think? And at first the girl had this frozen smile on her face. I think she was trying to hold it together. And then she just started crying, just a child. And I remember thinking, what are you doing about this? And the book wasn't available anymore in English. It was only available. In, and then I said, I must reissue the book. What do I do? So my agent and I talked about it. And we uh, uh, that's when we talked to Irene Stanton of Zimbabwe. And she said, the trouble is that publishing the book, nobody is going to buy the book. So 
it's very, because people in Zimbabwe, the economy is not doing very well. So I said, how much do you want the, uh, to sell? And said, if I know that I'll sell half the books, then I'll break even. So I said, okay, I'll try to do a fundraising. So I asked a lot of my friends in France, and I said, I'm going to do a fundraising. This is the reason, would you? And a lot of them, practically all of them said yes. And I had a dinner in my house where people read Chinongwa. I cooked food that is in Chinongwa's book. And I was able, I thought I was going to do it twice, but people gave so generously. The next day I phoned, I wrote Irene and I said, I've got the money, let's go. And that's how Chinongwa is back again. So I'm very, very grateful to, to my friends. I call them the Chinongwa patrons. In, in in France, who and then uh, as Spinifex said, we are on it. So I'm very very pleased. And and it was and, also published in South Africa, also wasn't it with Majaji? Yes, yes. Yeah. Irene, yeah. I helped, and then the editor from South Africa took it and published it, and then Spinifex have published. So I'm very very pleased and I think it's a very very important thing to to have a debate about child brides yes it's um the book is so important because it, it gives um a, a, a face a name um so that you identify on a personal level with 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 the um little girl you know so it, it gives a face to the problem of child yes. brides I think doesn't it? It, it, it? Yeah, it puts you in a situation where you can actually begin to understand it, rather than it just being, you know, a statistic. This is yeah, yeah, because we've got all these statistics, but it's just numbers. But when we have the person and we see her, we see her mother, and we see her being taken all over the place, like, like I don't know, like you would throw your guitar. I don't want it anymore. Does anybody want it? And also the fact that there is no the united nations there's nothing that is against it and i was saying in an interview recently that if a man we don't know or a neighbor or we don't know the man takes your child who is 12 and has sex with this child he is a pedophile he has committed a crime in practically every country but if the parents of the same little girl go to the same man and say, oh, yes, we can give you our daughter, give us a few goats, give me a Rolex or any little watch or I don't know, kettle or clothes, whatever you exchange with. Then we say it's a, a, this child becomes a bride, but it's the same child. The mm -hmm. hypocrisy of it all that... Uh, because the parents are there. I think some of you have seen uh, footage of somebody or the girl saying, I was told that there was a party and I was dressed nicely and these children are dressed nicely and there is a party, you sit down there and she is very well. And the man is there and at the end of the party, now you go with him. She has no idea what is in wait for her. And mm -hmm. I find that very, very difficult to say, okay, these are kids, they're not going to go into the street and say, we want our freedom and march down the street or block the highway like workers do. But if the people who are supposed to be there to protect them, do not protect them, give them to a 40 year old, who is going to, to protect? And I see in your, in your book, Robin, that there is the father, who says you are not going to school and the worst thing is that the boys can go to school it's the girls i think that that's what is because if you think all the children are going to sacrifice but there is the girl and the first girl and at first the father says no you are not going to work when uh clara is uh, they find a job for clara and mm -hmm. A father says, Matilda, you are not going to work. Your mother needs you. But when he really needs money, he finds a job for Matilda and says, you are going to, to work. 
Yes, so she goes to, a house. To, to the big house and cleans the house for, for money. Um, and that's all right for the to the father. Um, and I can remember my nana talking about the big house that she went to to go to work. I can't. Um, I've, I've fabricated a lot of the details because I can't remember the details of that one. But she in that house, she also sees another um, a richer family, a, a family that where the I girls loved that. I free. thought that was excellent. How she comes and then you see what the other people are living and what she is living. And then she's like, she knows more about them because she reads yes, than yeah. they know about her. I thought that was very clever. And the big house, I think it was very good because <laughs> the big house, another yes. world. Yes, that's what it was known as. Um, it, it's also interesting there that she encounters um, uh, a couple of Aboriginal uh, Aboriginal boy, actually just one, who's cleaning and mucking out the stables and things. And um, she's been told, her mother has told her that these um, boys come from a mission, with, which is where they're trained to be labourers. And, um, and she thinks about it. And her mother has also told her about um, a domestic college in um, Kutamundra, which is in Randra, where the, the book is set, where the okay. the girls, the Aboriginal girls, are sent to learn to be domestics and so they can go into the into, into the world. Service. So yes, yeah, so into service. Yeah. So and I also found another um how do I say a very uh similar for example in your in your book page ninety nine Matilda's father says, I won't stoop to hitting you, Matilda. You'll obey me until the day you are married, and then you obey your husband. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. And in my book, Chinongwa's father says, I gave you the life in you. I decide what to do with it. What I say is to be obeyed. Yes, so it's similar. Different worlds, yes. but the same you belong to me and then after you shall belong to your husband yes so going through life without ever being oneself and i was just thinking i had not read your book you had not read my book and this this how similar it is and when people sometimes say to me uh for example i was talking about how literature many people say in the uh interview that i had with um joy radio and uh loretta smith was saying to me this is the first time i interview an african and then she was asking questions about african literature and i was just saying you know literature is literature uh i don't know why you never say it's never said European literature, but yes. you the literatures that are othered are those that are not European. So literature is just literature. It's our lives. And wherever you are, I think we live more or less the same thing. And I, when I saw these two lines or when I was reading you and I was thinking, Yes, everywhere, even these men who have never met or European men or African men, they had this or they ha still have some of them uh, belief that they will tell you what to do. And they told women what to do. And you think, why is there no society that didn't tell women what to do. I hope we've come a long way from that now these days. But I, I sort of, having been a teacher um, too, I, I, I think that it's important for uh, the young people today to read these stories, to know what has happened to their forebears and um, be, be aware that it's been um, or still is being a process in some places to uh, stop this, to, you know, let women 
have their own identity and and you know do the things that they want to do i i very strongly believe that the young people should be reading this type of book um so they get you know the awareness of what has gone on yes yep. it is important and uh I would like to think, or I think in the Western world, things are changing, but at the same time, the position of the woman has always been very delicate because, I mean, look at the women in Afghanistan today. Yes. Their grandmothers or great-grandmothers were professors in university. They were doctors. They, 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 they did what they want. And some of those women today are behind the walls or if they go in the street they have to cover up the, the same women who taught and it's a strange uh thing to to say why is one person why does one person think that they have the right to tell another person to live in such a way and below them and be obeyed when you really sit down to think about it and why is it allowed to happen but at the same time look at what's happening in the states today we just had to have trump and raw versus word out so sometimes it's just one person so we really have to be vigilant all the time all the time because the rights we have today could be taken away tomorrow. And that's really, really uh, scary. And when I look at Tilly or Matilda, that uh, even when she gets married, I would say her life is a little bit better than her mother's. But at yep, the yes. end... It definitely is it better than her mother's. I, I think she, to begin with, she thinks she has found... Uh, and most of her life that she's equal with um, her husband Charles and um, so her she does live um, uh, not a fulfilled life but a life that is um, not nasty or horrible um, it's very she works very hard um, at yeah. doing all the farm things and bringing up the children and still um, being concerned about her siblings so she's very close to because she virtually brought them up as well because um, mama, her mama suffered on and off from depression and she mm. was often the one who was running the household. So the siblings are still uh, coming to her for to sort out their problems. Um, yeah, up and to the end, she, she's, she's caring for them, uh, feeling this responsibility. At the same time, even though she was the one responsible for practically everybody and also looking after her husband until the end, he is the one who decides yes. what happens to her. That broke my heart and made me angry. <laughs> um, a, a, a different type. Um, a different and, type. But it's so true. Yes. Even today. And I, I think it's um, slightly reflected in... I mean, Nana sort of, I won't go into the story. I've given her things in the story that she didn't actually really have in her life, things that I wanted for her. So part of it is is very fictionalised, the, the way the story ends. But she always wanted a place of her own, her independence. Um, and uh, when she was older, she virtually lived between um, our house and, um, and my uncle's house for a long time and didn't have that independence in reality. This is not, not what happens in the book. But I, I also think it's reflected today. There are, are a lot of older women who are now becoming, in Australia, are becoming um, homeless or yes. don't have enough money for retirement because they were the ones who... Um, gave up work to look after families and it's it's just be, it's becoming a problem here which is it's stop and think about it is absolutely totally ridiculous and wrong yes um, I, I remember uh, watching I don't know on television a, a, a woman who is living in a home because exactly like you said she's retired she worked all her life but she's got nothing 
And in France also, we have the same thing where we had a generation of women who worked with their husbands who was who could have been a farmer or they owned a shop and she worked in there but she didn't have a salary so she's considered somebody who never contributed to her retirement and when the husband dies she has nearly nothing she she has less of them can't even afford to live in the house that their husbands left for them because they they, they don't have enough money to pay the, the 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 bills, to pay the tax, to pay everything, or to maintain that house because they just don't have enough. But they have worked a little bit like Matilda the rest of their lives, look after everybody, including the animals and everything, but they were not working as uh, mm. usually today say, do you work? People are not saying, people say, no, I'm not working even though they wake up before everybody and they go to bed after everybody. But it's, and exactly. most of the time it falls on women. And, and yeah, I don't know, in Australia, yes, it's beginning to be a problem. And yeah. in France, I think the government, uh, the current government, Macron has decided to give all these women the minimum wage. Oh. Just, Yes, because they, they really didn't have anything and a lot of them worked. And when you say work, because you have to prove how many years you worked, how much you contributed. And they were like, I didn't, I wasn't considered a worker because I was helping my husband behind the counter in the shop or on the farm. So mm -hmm. either they were going to be in the street or they were going to be given a minimum wage just to survive but it's really just to survive so yeah maybe Australia could think about that because they are our mothers our grandmothers I think there is something being done about it at the moment I should be a bit more knowledgeable about that but there's something that um I think uh has been brought in to examine the situation here and to try and and um uh write it or try and and stop it from happening um, I hope so. There is discussion of the universal basic income, but uh, the chances of it actually being implemented are really, really slight, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but actually the other thing right. I wanted to ask both of you um, is the issue of shame because in, in both books um, the characters do experience shame so for 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 Chinongwa, um, you know, there is a terrible shame in because she is the second wife. She's girl. She's you know all these things, and she's been exchanged for a few cows. And and for Matilda, that sense of poverty, that that experience of poverty, and then going to the bigger house as you described. So I'd quite like to know what what both of you think about that as as an element in your story you go robin all right that's that's yeah it's, it's a very interesting thing i i think um tilly matilda is is um a shame she does not want to go and work for in um the big house she thinks she's doing enough at home and of course she is doing enough at home and uh well clara is um her younger sister who is um quite beautiful and goes to work in a store in town which is what Matilda would like to do if she you know if she was going to work at all um yeah she is she, there is there is shame there about that the fact that she can't reach the things that she wants to reach and things that she wants to be and she there's one stage in the in the book where she said I wish I'd been born a boy everything would have been easier if I'd been born a boy um and yeah that's I one know. of the things I had in common with Matilda because I think up until maybe eight the age of eight and maybe 10 there were times I said I wish I had been born a boy because boys could climb trees they could whistle they could go and play ball and they, they did you know they were kicking the ball all the time and girls we were sort of so Will you stop? Who is going to marry you if you, they see you kicking a ball? 
Nobody's ever going to marry you if they see you climbing a tree. Nobody will marry you if you are whistling. So you were there just to, 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 to be married. And this is also why Chinongo was uh, ashamed and furious because she was not even going to have the choice of finding uh, a, a husband who would desire her because she was already married when she's nine. She's already a, a married woman. And she is ashamed because, uh, not only because she was thin, which where I come from is not a good thing at all. A real woman has got big boobs, big thighs uh, that, that, that tremble when, you, when you, and she didn't have that. So she was ashamed of that. And she was also ashamed because no man desired her. She was given to somebody. And because all the girls were told that if you behave like this, if you don't whistle, if you are fat, and if you, men will be running to your door for you to because they'll all fall in love, that she didn't have that. And then she was the second wife. Normally men were supposed to like the second wife better than the first wife. And Sekuru wasn't really very keen on her. So that was a shameful thing. And just to be known as the wife who was given, you no, know, it means that you are an animal that comes from grassless lands. So it, it's not very so she was ashamed. And then she also, because her husband was ashamed to have a child as a wife. He was not proud of her, so she was ashamed of that even the old man that she's married is ashamed of her. And the shame was on her. Even when she is the one who is abused, you see the tables turned and it's her who is ashamed. It's her who is sent away. And like I said, when I was growing up, uh, we didn't like her. She was a bad woman. And she had a kind of apologetic way uh, going around. And at the same time, a kind of, I don't give a damn because she whistled, which was like, oh, she's whistling. But, and I didn't know what she meant by whistling until many, many years later. And I was writing the book then. So writing the book really made quite a few pieces of the puzzle fall into place to understand her shame the and the way the village kind of feared her at the same time, disliked her, but she was there, a reminder of what they had done to her. Robin, there's a wonderful scene in your book um, when Matilda goes into the shop and she starts looking at the books and then um, an older woman comes out and starts to talk to her. Can you, can you tell us about that? I think that, that was, that was a, a really fabulous moment. Uh, yes, so um, her sister Clara is working at the store. This is like the big, uh, the a department store, perhaps a, a, a general store, but it's quite a, a large store with lots of things in it. And Matilda sneaks in. She's meant to be looking after the babies in, in the dray outside with the horse, but she sneaks in to look at the store because there are so many fabulous things in there. And she spies a bookcase and the bookcase is full of books. And um, she can't help herself because she... She wants the book. She wants to read the book. She hasn't had a lot of books um, except for the ones that her teacher have, has given her from school. And so she um, starts taking them all out. And the old old Mrs McNabb, who used to be uh, a teacher in, um, in England, comes upon her and Matilda thinks she's done a terribly wrong thing, but Mrs McNabb says, oh, well, you've picked some good books there dear and bring them over here and let me have a closer look at what you you know what you're going to read and then um the books have been in that shop because the people in in this country town aren't readers 
and she gives the books to Matilda. Um, Matilda thinks she's going to have to buy them and father won't let her, but Mrs McNabb says, rubbish, books are meant to be read, not left on shelves to have dust all over them. And so, yes, she knows Matilda will take them home and devour them. Um, and so that that's sort of a lovely um, character to have in the book because she tells Matilda, you know, if you if fight them with knowledge, fight them with knowledge and, and win that way and you get your knowledge from the books you're reading and so that a friendship is set up there um, and Matilda gets lots more books through Mrs McNabb. It's a and that's, that's a fictionalised character. I mean, one of the things was I think Susan said to us uh, in a preamble was, you know, how did you change these facts into fiction? But, I mean, that's a, a character that Matilda needed to meet within the story so that she could get on with her reading. And that was um, a lovely to create a character like that who was on Matilda's side and a feminist and, yeah, so... It's beautiful. I loved it very much. I, I agree with Susan. It was just so beautiful. And the fact that when this woman comes, she 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 wants to run away. And, yes. and, and yeah, it was just beautiful, beautiful. And there are those waves, you know, of like the the Mrs. McNabb is kind of a grandmother figure for for Matilda. Um, and so there are these waves throughout the book of, of the older women coming in and creating yes. a space, you know, for the girls and so forth. I mean, it, it's wonderful. And I, I think uh, um, just to go back to similarities between our work, Lucy, the, the similarity of the fact that the, there are families, the families are involved in both books. So, yeah, so much, yes. And there so, are so many children. So many children. <laughs> so many children. My, my yes, grandmother was, was one of nine sisters, nine siblings also. So that was just standard. It was that era when, you know, children just popped out of you and the mothers, either you die or you you keep, you keep uh, on having them. them out. Yes. Yeah, it's true. There are children all over. I hadn't, uh, yeah, they're babies and a little bit older and a little bit older, but all the time there are children mm -hmm. around. And the women have no choice, really. And and when when um, Matilda's mom tells her, like you know, it's our job to satisfy the the men. You know, you you, it's it's like the I I loved it. Like that's the exchange for having a roof over your head. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And there are lots of other crossovers too. I mean, the the impact of colonization on differently both British colonization yes. but affected differently the different people in the different situations and so forth and I found that really fascinating as well yeah because it was more or less the same era mm. and when I was reading your book I was saying I would have been on the side of the Aboriginal girls who are looking at this white girl who is who would have been dressed better and everything and maybe admiring, maybe a little bit scared, um, uh, because I, I thought it was really good because they don't say anything, but when they lock eyes, they're just human beings. And then yes. Matilda goes back home and she's told, no, 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 there's a line. Hey, don't but cross nobody that line. explains exactly what it is, yeah. And I, I think the, the, the presence of all the the suggested presence of um, the colonisers in your story is um, what do you refer to them as, Lucy? Ne um, yes. Their knees? The kneeless. The kneeless. They wore trousers and so they looked like they didn't have any knees. And when I was growing up, my grandfather always called them Wasnama V in Shona and it meant the kneeless. Yeah. And yes. there was Queen Victoria, so they told them that the our our queen and the the the, the has bought your land and, and they didn't understand it at all because the land belonged to God. So who would sell does God deal in money? What 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 the hell was that? The land belongs to everybody. So they didn't understand. They were not even sure where they were coming from. They were used to, to trade with Portuguese who came 
took some gold and elephant tusks and went away. So when the British came, they thought the British were going to get a little bit of land. You go to the head men, they give you a little bit of land to grow your crops. And that's all, but nobody owns land. So they didn't realize that these were staying, they were being uh, colonized. So that's why uh, it was a surprise. And he says, why would you fight somebody with whom you don't have a quarrel? Because you fought with somebody that you know, and you have got an issue and you say, let's go to war because there were rules like today. Don't kill the women, but kill all the men. Don't use this weapon, but you can use the smaller one, even though it's, you know, stupid rules like that. So they didn't understand colonization. And it's interesting because it's the, the contrast yours is from the other side. Yes, and the interweaving of the of the impact of colonization, particularly on the, the young Aboriginal children that she sees down at the river and, and she, she just doesn't get it. Um, which is understandable that she doesn't get it. Yeah, um, when you are children, you don't understand it. I didn't understand apartheid until maybe I was 12 because your parents didn't say anything because you could get them into trouble. So they just saw you see a white person, just run away, just don't go and say hello or walk fast away and things like that. But if they order you to do something, just do it. And we did it. So you grow up thinking, okay, the tree, the the leaves of the tree are green. When a white person says, pick up my shoe from the floor, you just pick it up. And when your mother says, go to bed, you go to bed. <laughs> it was like that. And then much later, I think that there's something that is not quite right. What is it? But nobody told you. Uh, well, we've, we've done awful things to our Indigenous people here over the, you know, over the decades. Um, the, the stolen generation where the, the children were taken from their mothers, their families, and given to white mm. Christian families to bring up. Yes, as a yes. whole history. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, we have a referendum coming up. That's another. Yes, so that's that's another. another. <laughs> I mean, we could go on talking for hours and hours and hours, I think. But we have actually hit the one-hour mark. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll wind up because it's been so enjoyable listening to you. Um, Renata, um, do you think you could come in at this point and uh, say your thank yous? Turn your While we wait, I would like yeah. to thank everybody oh. from France, from England who have logged in. Thank you very much. And from Australia. Yeah, again. Ah. Back to you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, well, first of all, my big, big thanks um, go to Robin and to Lucy for both your fabulous books. And uh, indeed, as Susan said, we could have gone on for another hour. And, you know, I guess it's the power of fiction that you can write books about patriarchy, basically, because that's what it is. That's the system that men have to dominate women. And sadly, we're, we're still living it um, every day of our lives in some countries, much more than in others. But all women still have pat patriarchy to contend with. So thank you very, very much for bringing these powerful stories. And um, we're very proud that Spinifex to obviously um, having you published. So I, books don't just fall from heaven. You all know that. And I want just to thank everybody who's been involved. First of all, Susan, who is our wonderful publisher. I mean, together with me, but she's really the boss lady. So thank you, Susan. Um, then thank you to Rachel, who is also a boss lady, and she often saves us from ourselves <laughs> when we can't find something or, like, I have to write to her and say, did I actually register Rachel or not? So, like, you know. So, Rachel, thank you very much for everything you do. Without you, you know, usual sentence, we wouldn't exist. Um, Pauline Hopkins, who sadly couldn't be here today, she edited uh, both Robin's books and also Lucy's book together with Susan and me. And uh, I think with Robin, uh, Pauline even read it, read your, your book, your manuscript, I should say, before we even uh, got to look at it. So 
Pauline is a fabulous editor, so big thanks to Pauline in her absence. Then Caitlin, who is here somewhere without a photo, who makes sure that whatever we do goes up on Instagram and now, what is it called? X and um, and Facebook. And so thank you to Caitlin for also your wonderful, cheerful presence. Then our office manager, who I'm not sure if she is actually here, Danielle Osborne, who very, very professionally, you know, guides us through all the mazes that come up when you need to count books and uh, store books and sell books, of course. Very important person. Then I also really want to uh, mention two women who are not, strictly speaking, of Spinifex, but they're really part of the Spinifex team. I mean, I think you both your books look beautiful. And um, Susan and I in particular, uh, but the others too, but we are very, very proud of our beautiful books. We spend a lot of time making very beautiful covers. And the woman who helps us do that, does the work actually, is called Deb Snipson. And she has been working with us for years. And both covers are really, really lovely and wonderful and powerful. And lastly, but not least, is um, Helen Christie, who is responsible for the beautiful interior of the books, because that too is, is really an art. And again, we, we take great pride in not just sort of like formatting and using whatever old font, but to actually make sure that every book gets its own font and its own design, and Helen is is uh, with uh, doing this. So we're very, very fortunate that we have this very strong and very, uh, very strong of powerful women who, and we all work together trying to publish books that make actually an impact. And I think both your books really make a big impact. And now I think you said it, Robin, or maybe both of you did. We need to get young people especially young women to read books again because you know that they're, they're not really strong readers and somehow or other <clears throat> I think that needs to change because you only know what you're doing in life when you know your history so I think I will um, I'll give back to you Susan if you have final last words um, <clears throat> well really just thank you so very much it's been um, wonderful to be able to hear you speak and Rachel is uh, screen sharing um, how you can get hold of the books. And uh, it's also been such a delight to work with, with you and um, to see the process and, and so forth. So there is a special offer, remember? So um, because it's also a dual book launch, um, you can actually go into either on the website and you can choose either the book that you're most interested in or you can buy both and actually save 25% and you just do it from the either book. So it's actually quite convenient. And that, that gives you a drop-down menu mm. and you can choose the other one as well. So it's wonderful um, to have that, Rachel. Thank you. Oh, and there's a free postcode as well for Australian addresses. Yes, yes. So okay. um, I think that's it. <laughs> quite done. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's somebody just... And thank the... you to everybody for coming. So that was really it's a good audience and uh, enjoy the books. <laughs>